Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going old school. I'm not using the auto cue. In fact, the last time I was in this hall, it was for another dinner, it was some TV awards dinner, and I brought my daughter along with me. And I remember her being very, very excited because she met Ant and or Deck. I'm never sure which, who it was. I'm not, I don't think Ant and or Deck are here this evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure you won't mind a theoretical physicist uh, sharing his thoughts with you. Um, in any case, I should explain that my father was an electrical engineer. My brother, woohoo! <laughs> my, my brother qualified as a chemical engineer, uh, then went into accountancy because that's what everyone <laughs> did in the 1980s. Uh, and last but not least, my son David here is my guest this evening, and he's in his fourth year of an M -Eng in electronic engineering at Southampton. <laughs> <Woohoo>! <laughs> I also thought I'd, I'd embarrass uh, David by sharing with you his excuse for not following in his old man's footsteps into physics. Um, he said, Dad, you can do the deep thinking. I want to do something useful. I think that's a pretty good stab at defining the difference between maybe engineering and theoretical physics, but I'm sure you'll all admit, as I'm sure David knows full well, physics can also be useful, and engineers have been known to have occasional deep thoughts. <laughs> that's right. Winning the audience over, that's, that's what it's all about. The only other occasion I was here at the IET dinner was a few years ago when I was the guest of the then president of the IET, uh, and my boss, the vice chancellor of the University of Surrey, Chris Snowden. And um, the, the speaker then was uh, the broadcaster, John Humphreys. Uh, I'd like to think that at least I'm maybe closer to your world than him, although I'm not saying there was anything wrong with, with, with his, his speech on the evening. Um, last March, I had the honor of chairing, no, chairing's not the right word, facilitating um, the, uh, the inaugural Global Grand Challenges Summit held at the IET in Savoy Place, which brought together nearly 500 engineers, scientists, in industry leaders, policy makers, educators, designers, artists, uh, eco economists and politicians. It certainly brought home to me just how vital engineering will be in, in, in tackling so many of the world's major uh, challenges in the coming decades, from energy to water and food supply, to tackling climate change and its effects, to the almost limitless opportunities made available by modern technology and, and, and the web and so on. So this, this uh, summit was joint, jointly organized by the engineering academies of the UK, the US and, and China, uh, and covered a wide range of issues, as you might expect from a, a global um, challenges summit. Uh, issues to do with technology, health, sustainability, education, and so on, and included addresses from some sort of high-profile people, people like Bill Gates and, and Craig Venter, and even the rapper Will I Am, who, by the way, made some fascinating and salient points about engaging with young people from deprived backgrounds, and he's very involved through his charity work in, in this even though I, I suspect a large fraction of the audience, particularly the Chinese delegates, were really not sure who the hell Will I Am was. <laughs> it, it was a bit of a, bit of a surprise. Um, there have been, I mean, uh, the president mentioned earlier, there have been a number of initiatives, and there are continuing to be a number of initiatives to raise the profile of engineering among the wider public and to inspire the next generation of engineers. Uh, I'm thinking of a few examples. The, the, um, the Big Bang Fair, which Engineering UK plays play such a pivotal role in running, and where I've had the honor in, in judging the young scientist and young engineer of the year. Some of these students, these are sort of A-level students, are, it's quite scary how, how bright they are. And it would be a real tragedy if we lost some of these guys to banking, for instance. Likewise, the, uh, the newly set up uh, Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, a global million pound prize to rival the Nobels, I am sure will do an important job in raising the profile of engineering. But while many are, are active in trying to raise the profile of all STEM subjects, uh, we continue to hear that this country doesn't produce enough engineers. So why is that message not getting through? 
Certainly, it would seem that science and engineering um, subjects at UK universities are finally seeing a genuine turn of their fortunes towards, you know, really in numbers are increasing in, in a quite impressive way. Certainly, I, um, for my sins, I, I, uh, I run the admissions for my physics department at Surrey. Uh, yes, my colleagues are very kindly ensuring that I don't turn into a complete media whore. Um, and, and this year, I've seen numbers of applications to the physics department go through the 1,000, which is about 90% up on the numbers last year, itself a record year. And it's not just physics. I was, I was talking to a colleague just today who said our mechanical engineering department has doubled its number of applications since last year. And I'm sure the University of Surrey isn't alone in this. So, so we are st seeing students in increasing numbers turning towards uh, STEM subjects. Certainly it's a worry if every one of those students that we've made offers to gets their grades and decides to come to Surrey, then uh, I get it in the neck from my colleagues because they haven't got labs big enough to, to uh, fit them all in. But it's a nice problem to have. When it comes to getting kids more interested in engineering, you have to look carefully at school curricula in science and maths and the way they are provided. The way they're taught needs to be developed, needs to evolve uh, in the light of advances in technology, such as the use of multimedia and the internet, um, virtual learning. Uh, and in any case, the challenges facing the next generation of scientists and engineers will be very different to those faced by us or those that, with the reasons that inspired us to enter science and engineering when we were young. I'm part of an exciting uh, initiative at the Royal Society, a group of people, we, we, we have the grand title of, uh, of the Vision Committee, uh, looking at the provision of science and maths education in schools from the age of five up to 19. Uh, and we're looking at all aspects of how STEM subjects are taught at school, from the way um, things like engineering and design are merging. Uh, just ask yourselves, for example, why Apple have been so successful in recent years, combining technology with aesthetics, to the way subjects traditionally taught in silos, maths, physics, chemistry, biology, are going to have to merge. There's going to have to be a blurring of the boundaries uh, between them as we move towards a more interdisciplinary way of teaching the, these subjects. It's certainly happening already in industry, in academia, in research, uh, and I, I would like to see it progress all the way down through our education system. We're looking at how traditional modes of teaching will have to change in the coming 10 to 20 years, not that crystal ball gazing really can ever be very accurate. How, who, who could have predicted the way technology would have evolved to today, the way where it is today, looking going back just 10 years. We're very aware that educating the next generation in these subjects is not only about training our future top scientists and engineers, those who are going to go on to university to study these subjects, but also in having to create a better informed, scientifically literate population. And of course, we shouldn't forget that uh, many of the careers and professions in, in engineering, for example, uh, require vocational rather than formal academic emphasis. But coming back to the, the present day, I still think engineering has yet to, to get that star treatment, to become cool. For many people, an engineer is still a man, yes, it's always a male, with a hard hat, or the guy who comes around to fix your boiler. If you were asked to name, or if members of the public were asked to name a famous physicist, they shouldn't, wouldn't have any problem. They would say Albert Einstein, or Stephen Hawking, or even Brian Cox, and I'm fine with that. <laughs> but what about famous engineers, uh, or famous living engineers at that? Even James Dyson is regarded as an inventor, not an engineer. So, if it's to get the star treatment, where are the role models? And, yeah, I mean, it doesn't pay me to say this, where is the Brian Cox of engineering? I recently had the pleasure of visiting, uh, just outside Bristol, the workshops where they're developing um, uh, Bloodhound SSC, the project aiming to build 
this vehicle that's hoping to smash the land speed record. More than that, hoping to break 1,000 miles an hour. That's twice the speed of a, an air jet airliner. And trust me, it's more than just building a more powerful engine or designing better aerodynamics. The range of engineering challenges the team is having to face to con and, 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 and conquer is truly remarkable. They'll be using a jet engine from a European fighter jet just to get the vehicle up to 300 miles an hour and then a rocket fueled by hydrogen peroxide kicks in to boost it up to 1,000 miles an hour. Just, and seeing the cockpit where the driver has to sit just behind the, the fuel, just in front of the fuel tank is, is uh, rather scary. But even down to the alignment of the thousands of rivets in the titanium skin that's uh, connected to the, the shell of the vehicle, uh, that is made with literally laser uh, precision. That's the sort of engineering project that has star quality. Now, you might think, so what? What's the use of such an expensive toy uh, beyond making the headlines or, I don't know, exciting the Jeremy Clarksons of this world? But I think it is high time that engineering as a profession had a bit of a glamour makeover. And I say this with some authority, you know, as I'm, the, I'm proud to announce that this week's Radio Times, in previewing my Radio 4 program, Life Scientific, referred to me, I don't know if anyone saw this, it was right at the back, very small, but it did refer to me as the BBC science pin-up boy. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. I, it was my mum who called me to say that she'd read it, but I, I, will, I will still take it. Well, I, I think that's really all I had to say. I would like to end this address by proposing the toast. So if you'd all please be upstanding. Again. The toast to the Institution of Engineering and Technology. May it flourish root and branch forever. The IET. Thank you very much.